My name is Greg Scharf. I'm happy to be here today with David Jackman. My uh, role here at Trinity is relating to help people become good expository preachers. And in that role, we have uh, the ROM Lectures, our annual lectureship on expository preaching. It's been a great privilege to have David with us this week, who's delivered two lectures and uh, preached as a way of demonstrating that he uh, practices what he preaches. So, David, welcome. Thank you very much. I wonder if it would help our listeners who are mainly going to be pastors and observers, if you just remind or tell them a little of your background how the Proclamation Trust came to being your own pastoral background yourself. I know what it's like as a pastor. We don't like to listen to anybody who's not been in the trenches. So right. tell us some of the background. Yes. And we'll go from there. Well, currently I'm uh, the director of the Proclamation Trust, which is an organization in England which seeks to encourage expository preaching. We do conferences for pastors and teachers, and we run a one-year ministry training course with its emphasis on preaching. And I've been uh, involved in that ministry for 16 years now. But before that, for 15 years, I was pastor of uh, an evangelical free church congregation in uh, Southampton on the south coast of England. Um, And so I had 15 years in local church leadership, Mm -hmm. three years as the associate pastor and then 12 as the senior pastor before I moved to London. Before that, I worked with InterVarsity, so I had some experience with students as well. Great. I was greatly benefited this week by the reminder and the emphasis that uh, God's word in the hands of God's spirit actually does God's work. Mm -hmm. So the strong emphasis on the sufficiency of scripture Mm -hmm. and the sufficiency and and finality of Christ himself and his work Mm -hmm. uh, encapsulated in the gospel. When you travel and give expositions and give training there at the Cornhill Training Center, what are the kind of deficiencies or difficulties that you find pastors need to have addressed as often as any? And what do you see that they are doing that isn't, isn't really cutting it? Do they give you that kind of feedback, or can you observe it when you watch them preach? Yes, I, I think the big challenge is to be relevant in a contemporary context, but to be driven by Scripture in the way in which we preach. So I think a lot of men... They feel the challenge of how can I relate to this culture and the enormous number of problems that there are within the church and outside of the church, uh, the opposition that there is to the Bible, and certainly in our culture in the UK, an increasing hostility towards Christianity. Mm-hmm. Um, so to have the confidence that the word really does do the work right. is one of the things that we build, try to build in through our ministry. And typically men will come to our conferences and go away after three or four days saying, Well, I really needed that to bring me back to what I'm supposed to be doing, to know that those hours that I spend in the study in prayer and preparation are not wasted hours, that I really am serving my people best Mm -hmm. as I prepare the word to preach and teach it to them, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in all the variety of ministries in the local church. So I think it's, it's having the confidence in the sufficiency of Scripture and that God will not have left us without a sufficient tool mm-hmm. to do the job in the 21st century. Right. I think that's the key thing. Great. I've heard you several times this week in different uh, formats and venues and in private conversation talking about some very practical and down-to-earth steps pastors can take. If you had to pick out uh, two or three or four, mm-hmm. on one of those occasions you gave us ten very practical <laughs> steps, but... Yes. If you were going to say to a pastor, if you didn't do anything else in this whole ministry of faithfully expounding the word, what kinds of things would would that include? Well, the way I'm sort of expressing it at the moment, and one looks for different ways of trying to get across to people, is this uh, image that I used in one of the lectures of where is the Bible in our preaching and in our leadership of the church. And it seems to me that the Bible encourages us to make the Bible, and therefore Christ, because it's his word, his enduring living word, to make that central to everything that we do in our preaching. Mm -hmm. So people talk to me about having a Bible-based ministry, but I want them to have a Bible-focused ministry, because Mm -hmm. that will mean it's a Christ-focused ministry. Mm -hmm. Um, It was said of John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, that his blood was bibline, Mm -hmm. that if you cut him, the Bible would flow out of his veins. Mm -hmm. And... I think in preaching and teaching the word, the more the word of God dwells in us richly and the more our blood is bibline, the more we shall know that the, dr- that the Bible has to be in the driving seat. Right. 
So what I was saying earlier in the week was that in some churches the Bible's in the trunk and in some churches it's in the back seat. Mm -hmm. And in many evangelical churches, I think it's in the passenger seat. So it's there to be referred to and it's there for people to use as a navigational aid and for conversational purposes, Mm -hmm. but it's not driving the car. It's not driving the church and sometimes it's not driving the sermon, really. So many of us, I think find that we begin to dry up when we're thinking about how can I make this text relevant to the people. Whereas if we have faith in the sufficiency of God's word to be relevant in itself, why would God ever say anything that was irrelevant? Exactly. (laughs) Then um, that will give us the motivation to keep working hard at the text. So the first thing I think that uh, that the Bible preacher needs to be reminded of again and again is that the sufficiency is in the word. And that if you work hard at the word, it will yield its treasures and it will always be fresh and it will always speak to the needs of your people. Absolutely. Going back to the word and bringing out treasures, both new and old. There's yes. going to be fresh things, but also yes. old things that are never, nevertheless timeless. Absolutely. And, and I mean, the apostle says, you know, I'm, I know you know these things and that's why I'm telling you them again, because right. uh, you need to know them. And so often what is assumed in one generation gets lost in the next because it hasn't really been taught and um, enthusiastically communicated. So, so that would be the, one, the first thing, I think. And then uh, I think it would be to know your congregation as well as you can. I'm sure our pastoral work helps us in that. But to think through the different contexts and the different issues that people are facing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes our preaching is biblically sound and doctrinally correct. But my series of lectures this week was called Preaching That Connects. And what I was trying to look at was how we can really land on the home territory of the people who are listening to us Sunday by Sunday. Mm. And I think that involves, obviously, all the pastoral skills of ministry, listening to people, sharing their burdens, mm. carrying, helping to carry their weight, but also having a lively interest in the culture that we're in mm-hmm. and what they're facing out there on the front line day by day in the culture, the sort of negativity, cynicism about the gospel, the challenges that are being made about the person and work of Christ, about the sufficiency of scripture, about comparative religions, all of these things that they, as soon as they start to witness, they come up against these pressures. And I think the contemporary preacher, to have a cutting edge into the culture, needs to be as aware as we can be uh, of what's going on, because we often, as pastors, spend more time in our own little network than we do in the big wide world. So let me interrupt there, David, Mm. and ask how, as a working pastor, you stayed in the Word, did the hard work you've talked about this week about really working in the text, and how do you keep up on cultural things? Do you have some uh, sources you go to for information, or is it just general uh, sources? Yes. I mean, I I take a couple of weekly news magazines, which do digests of... um, the world's press, really, Mm -hmm. so that I try and keep up with what's happening there. Working with younger people is a huge asset. I mean, younger staff uh, in fellowship or younger people in your church and sitting down and talking to them and, you know, going out, having a cup of coffee and saying, so what's bugging you? What are Mm -hmm. the problems? What are you facing? Um, Interacting in that way. Um, And I think, too, uh, over the years, I've sometimes had a study group where we've looked at a book together or we've looked at an issue together. I'm not actually involved in a group like that at the moment, but that's been fruitful. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, if if one's antennae are up all the time, you pick Mm -hmm. up where it's going. And that doesn't mean then that the culture is in the driving seat, Mm -hmm. but it means that you know what you are seeking to relate to. Mm -hmm. So it could be that um, the scriptural content... um, is not dominant enough in our preaching. Or it could be that the biblical exegetical work is being well done, but the bridge isn't being built into where the people are. So that would be another major uh, necessity. I I agree with this, that it seems like there are some in our midst who are wonderful students of culture, Mm. but they haven't really got a biblical and theological grasp of the whole of Scripture Mm. and how it speaks to that. Others who are in a cave someplace with their Bible, (laughs) and the bridge doesn't touch down on the other side at all. So getting that balance right is a a challenge. The other thing I find that pastors say is that I'm I'm really too busy to do this properly. And their priorities, they feel, are dictated by the expectations of the congregation. I wonder how, as a long-term project, 
we can help pastors help their congregations, help them mm -hmm. by reshaping their priorities. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you've seen that done well or if your own experience could mm -hmm. be instructive for us. I was um, blessed really by working under a pastor who believed in giving his mornings to the study and encouraged me as his uh, assistant to do that and it's a habit I got into and mm -hmm. uh, tried to sustain. Uh, I think we can give a good amount of time to study. I mean, if you think of, say, four mornings of three hours in the week, 12 hours study, uh, in order to preach well on Sunday, I would say that uh, that's a really almost a minimal requirement. Mm -hmm. I think when young men come out of seminary, often they have an unrealistic view of how much time they can spend in preparation. Right. And the danger is, if you're looking at, say, 20 hours or something like that, or even more, which is unrealistic, that you then swing across and say, well, I can't do it that way, so it's not really worth spending much time on it at all. Mm -hmm. Or I'll just pick up a few ideas from the Internet, I'll download, download somebody else's work right. and those sorts of things. And it's tempting, isn't it, because there are so many resources around today. Right. But if you're not in the Word yourself and the Word is not in you, you're not going to be a, a minister that will last the course and that will really effectively communicate. Right. And, and so I think... I think there has to be that side of things, that um, a commitment to saying this is important enough for me to put it in my diary mm -hmm. and make sure that this is my regular commitment. One of the changes that I have noticed is that when uh, I was at beginning as a pastor, John Stott said to me, don't open the mail until after lunch, yes. which was one little practical way of enforcing this same kind yes. of rule. Yes. But now, of course, you go to your desk and the minute you turn on your computer, you yes. may have 10 or 15 or more emails, yes. and yes. you have other things that are built in distractions. So probably the guidance we give to our students, you in the Cornhill training program and me here at Trinity, has to include things like discipline yourself in yes. that respect, yes. not to look at that, yes. not to feel that that dictates your schedule. Yes. As yes. I've heard Alastair Begg say, my shoes should be shined and under my desk by 8 o'clock every morning. Right. And uh, from my point of view, perhaps earlier than eight is necessary to yes. get the work done. Yes. Now, whatever uh, system suits, I think we, we need to know what our, our length of concentration span is. That's right. There are some men who are very active, and you know, an hour's study will be very productive, but the second hour, they'll be itching to get out and do things. And right. I would say to people like that, then you've got to divide up your week so that your hours are there mm -hmm. and that they're at the most productive time. But if it's no good sitting at the desk for three hours if only one of the hours is really productive. Right. So know what your own study patterns are and um, try and uh, work within that. But I do agree with you. I think that, um, and of course it's the way to prepare a sermon is day by day doing um, different ingredients so that it's percolating through one's mind the whole week and it becomes a part of one's life. Yes. Now, I think uh, the, the danger is that many men are just driven by the demands of the congregation, mm -hmm. and we all are, unless we really make a, a definite commitment to say, my preparation time is as much a booking as my pastoral appointments right. or my hospital visitation or, or whatever it may be. It's maybe useful, and I say this to my students, that if you have a congregation of 200 people and you're going to preach for half an hour, that's 100 parishioner hours that you're investing for this modest 12 to 15 yes. hours a week. Yes. So if you prioritize that, you're really serving the whole congregation yes. much better than if you did yes. otherwise. And getting the congregation to see that is often the key. Yes. Yes. If we're a faithful workman there, I think the results are going to be good in the lives of our folks, and they will say, this is worth it. We have to help him protect this time. Yes. Sometimes that relates to who you have for support staff who can field phone calls and other things that you can't control. And I'm conscious, too, in these days of uh, virtual offices and things that there are more people, church planters and others, who don't have the luxury of a, a human being to sort of protect their door and their mm -hmm. telephone. So you'll have to take some radical steps. And some mm -hmm. people do this by going to a library or going to some other place where they can simulate iso isolation mm -hmm. with the text. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure that's right. We've got to find a way of doing it. It's answer phones. It's just stealing ourselves not to mm -hmm. go to the emails, as you were saying. But 
if we really believe that this is how we serve our people best, right. then I find it's a great motivation to say, well, if I'm going to love my flock and really serve them well, if I don't feed them well, right. who's going to do it? Exactly. And if they're not being fed, how can we expect them to be effective in their right. daily lives and, and witness out there in the world? So I think it's absolutely vital that we do this and see it as the core of the pastoral ministry. I mean, we're ministers of the word in everything we're doing, mm -hmm. in our visitation, in our leadership of committee meetings, in our planning strategies, all of these things. It seems to me that the calling of the pastor teacher is to take the word of God and apply it to this whole range of issues within the church and without. And therefore, we do need to be really feeding on the word ourselves. Mm -hmm. Can I just say two things about that? One is that I found it was good to prepare in the quarter ahead of my preaching in my own personal Bible reading, what I was going to preach the next quarter, uh, which doesn't mean that one's personal Bible reading is sort of forked over one's shoulder to the congregation, mm -hmm. but that you immerse yourself in the section of Scripture you're going to be preaching mm -hmm. so that God deals with you through it. Mm -hmm. And I think that enables then a heart-to-heart -heart communication, which really is more than simply truth for the mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's another level that the people know that from your heart to their heart, right. you're seeking to communicate the truth. And I think that truth can be put another way, and that is that sometimes when God wants to say something to the congregation, he first says it to us. Yes. And many times I got excited about a book of the Bible as I was reading through it that hadn't recently excited me, and I thought, the congregation needs to hear this. Yes. And that helped me make the decision about what was going to happen yes. next quarter or next year, That's right. depending on when it happened. So it works both ways. Yes. It? Sometimes it's congregational need, right. and you feel, well, what part of Scripture should we go to? Sometimes it's, as you say, that the Lord just ministers to us through right. a particular part of the Word, and then, we, then there's a burning fire to preach it. Right. Yes. Well, I interrupted a moment ago. Were there, are there other things that you would say if you had to do just a few things, you know, if you were limited and yeah. were not? Were there other things that you'd put right up there high on your list of things to attend to as, as pre